Hopefully everybody had a great uh, weekend and holiday weekend. Uh, a lot of people are out of town and some are sick as well. Um, we're going to be wrapping up our uh, class here for the year and we're going to be in the short letter of Jude. So if you have your Bible, open it up and we're going to begin our study here in just a moment. Uh, Lord willing, this Sunday uh, the book of Acts will be completed. I think Stu is going to be wrapping up Acts chapter 28 this Sunday. <laughs> Acts chapter 28. Then next Wednesday, uh, we're going to have a song service here Wednesday night. And so uh, please be here for that. It's going to be very encouraging as well. Um, or I'm sorry, next Wednesday we'll have the song service. And then uh, the following Sunday we'll start a new quarter that will be uh, January 7th. We're going to do something a little bit different with that too. Uh, we're going to be going through our Bible reading. So that will be a Bible reading class. All of us will be here in the auditorium. And if you have not picked up one of those brochures, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, there will be a pretty good amount of Bible reading for all of us to do in the new year. We're going to go through the Old Testament. But I think it's going to be a great study. And so we'll cover uh, a series of chapters when we begin that class. There won't be a workbook. Uh, but I'll send out some questions and some thoughts for you to think about as you go through that reading. And if you have questions along the way, uh, certainly we can talk about that as well. So uh, a lot of great things to look at or to, uh, to go through. Uh, it's been a great year here at West Main. Thank you all for uh, your love and your work here at the congregation. That's one of the big themes in First and Second and Third John, uh, love for one another. And uh, it's been a blessing uh, being able to, uh, to see that love and uh, demonstrate it in action, in worship, and assisting one another. Uh, there's a lot of members who are going through a lot of challenges at this time, and it's great to be able to have brothers and sisters in Christ to uh, encourage one another uh, along the way. Let's look at Hebrews 3 and verse 14. If you want to quote it with me, let's go ahead and say it. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And that's going to dovetail perfectly into our theme into uh, 2024 uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 57 and 58. Let's keep in mind the fellowship that we do have with Christ. That's another big theme that we've looked at uh, in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John as well. I don't know if that TV is, is on in the back. I can't see the slides back there. Um, I want to just uh, hear from you real quickly if you have any thoughts. Uh, we've looked at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, you know, one of the great benefits of studying that book uh, is really to see what discipleship is about, uh, to be reminded about the importance of fellowship, uh, to be reminded about what sin is, uh, but also confidence in our salvation. Uh, confidence in our salvation and what Christ has done for us. I think that's something very important. Uh, we also have been reminded about the danger of false teachers, uh, Gnosticism. There's a particular kind of teaching uh, that was threatening the early Christians. And that's what we're going to see as well in this short letter from Jude. Um, real quickly here, is there anything uh, that really um, had a big impact on you as you were going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, just in your own reading that you like to share, or something that maybe you had forgotten about, or something that... Uh, you already knew to be true, and yet it was something that was really emphasized even more, something that you're going to hold on to. Anyone have any thoughts from 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John? If not, then we'll move on. Yeah, go ahead, brother. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing. <laughs> how man has been and is and will be is they vault their own knowledge and their own wisdom and their own power limited to this that really is above God's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Any other thoughts from 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John we want to share? Well, I would encourage you to, to go back and continue to read those. If I were to ask you, you don't have to answer this. Uh, when was the last time you read the letter of Jude? Uh, I don't know how many of us sit down at the kitchen table throughout the week or uh, make that a, a, a point of emphasis. You know, there are bigger books like Acts, for example, or Romans or uh, Old Testament prophets and things like that. But these small letters, sometimes they can be overlooked. Um, but these are inspired letters. So whether it's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, um, you know, imagine if John knew us, you know, what would he say about us? Would we 
fall into that category like Gaius or Demetrius in 3 John. Um, and so think about these small letters that sometimes can be uh, overlooked um, because there's a lot of benefit. They are inspired words as well. Uh, let me ask you a question as we get started here. If someone were to ask you to basically summarize, what is Jude really all about? Um, what's Jude all about? Let's talk about this for a few minutes, and maybe we'll get a couple of people to assist with this. How would you summarize this letter from Jude? What is Jude all about, this small little letter? Yeah. Uh, first, we to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay. So it's all about what? Contending for the faith? Okay. Depending on which kind of scholars you look at, this was written sometime in the 60s AD. So this is a couple of decades, maybe as many as 30 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The different missionary journeys, all the different things that we've read about this previous quarter in the book of Acts. And so the, the teaching was not unfamiliar yeah. to a lot of these New Testament Christians. They had been converted by somebody who had been converted by somebody else. I mean, there was some history there. Yeah. And it was just a reminder to contend for that faith. And it's something that. It's something that we have to do, especially today, or even more so today. Is, you know, I've always heard the phrase, uh, whether it's your faith or democracy, if it's never more than one generation away from extinction or apostasy, you know, it requires constant vigilance, and this is a reminder. Yeah. So verse 3 is one of the big verses. Thank you for that. Um, this idea of contending for the faith. Let's add on to that. Um, how would you describe or define the faith? Let's talk about that, because if we're to contend, um, that word contend means to, to fight or to defend, uh, to be able to, to stand up and say something. That's what Jude is going to do. He's going to remind these saints, what is the faith that he speaks of? How do we define what this faith is? Because it's something that we have to be able to um, talk about, contend earnestly for, so how would you guys define the faith? Let me hear from someone else. Yeah. So ultimately, I mean, it's, it's the gospel of Christ. And with them at that time, the apostles were continuing to share what Christ had shared when he was with them, what they observed and what they saw. So you're contending for that faith <laughs> because people were coming in and trying to incorporate other things, share different thoughts, try to incorporate sin and things like that. So... What they were fighting for, what we're fighting for, all has to be based on the foundation that Christ said. Yeah, good. So the faith is what has been delivered, uh, certainly the gospel message uh, of who Jesus is and what he has done. And there's a lot that would encompass that, right? Think about Ephesians 4 and verse number 5. Uh, the Bible says that there is one faith. So we see that this faith is singular in nature. Uh, we see that the faith is something that is distinct and identifiable, enough for us to actually contend for it or to fight for it or to stand up and to defend what is actually true. Notice, if you go to Jude, verse number 3 as well, and then we'll go back to verse 1. He says, Beloved, I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation. He's not downgrading their salvation in Christ when he says common, but this like faith that they all had, both Jew and Gentile, this salvation that they had in Jesus Christ. He says, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. So notice that the faith, there is this, um, and he's anticipating that this is complete, what has been given with respect to uh, to the saints and to the disciples uh, that the apostles had shared. This is one of the more important verses when you start talking to individuals, maybe like with um, uh, Mormons and things like that, right, where there's additional uh, revelation beyond the Bible and things like that. What Jude is saying here, no, the faith has been delivered uh, once for all. And there's some other passages we'll look at here. So Jude is going to make a great appeal, and he's also going to warn uh, these disciples or Christians that he's writing to uh, because of, again, false teaching. And it seems to be very similar to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 
with respect to Gnosticism, and we've talked a great deal about that. And what these teachers are doing, we've talked about the Antichrist, they're turning the grace of God, I did a sermon on grace this past Sunday, they're turning the grace of God and abusing the grace of God and trying to make it a license to sin um, with respect to licentiousness or sensuality uh, and sinful behavior. So what Jude is going to do, he's going to uh, encourage these Christians uh, to be aware, to warn, uh, to remind them about uh, punishment that has taken place in the Old Testament. It's a very fascinating letter. You have Michael the archangel who's mentioned. Uh, you have a battle of the body of Moses with uh, the devil and Michael the archangel. Uh, you have Enoch who is, I believe, mentioned in uh, Genesis chapter 5. Uh, where apparently he did some prophesying as well uh, about these individuals who would rebel against God and rebel against his authority. Um, You have many individuals in the Old Testament like Cain and Balaam and Korah. Uh, It's a great reminder of knowing the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, While we're not under that law, uh, we certainly uh, need to know it uh, because those things that were written before time were written for our learning according to Uh, Romans chapter 15. So let's just talk a little bit about this. When you look at verse number one, and we'll go through some of the questions as well. And if there's some bigger questions that you want to touch on, um, we can talk about that early too. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So number one, notice how Jude describes himself. He's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. It's believed that this was a half-brother of Jesus. We know that Jesus had siblings, according to John chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 5 as well. Uh, But notice that he just describes himself as the bondservant or slave of Jesus Christ. Uh, The Apostle Paul would often describe himself in that manner as well. Look Look at how he writes to these Christians and describes them. To those who are the called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Christ Jesus. Uh, These individuals, when it says that they had been called, uh, they had been called by the gospel. If you turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 14, Paul is going to remind these Christians here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we'll start in verse 13 and 14, about how they had been called by the gospel as well. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel. You may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're called and set apart through Christ uh, and through obedience of uh, the gospel. Uh, This word beloved uh, is another um, very interesting word here. Uh, Certainly it's shown that they're loved by God or wrapped in his love and so you see again this relationship of or fellowship that they have and we have in christ we've been called by the gospel Um, we have this love from god Uh, if you look at verse number 17 of jude he's going to remind them he says in verse 17 but you beloved ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our lord jesus christ He's going to talk about words that were uh, given by the apostles of warning, but that's how individuals are called, by the words of the apostles, through the teaching uh, and the preaching of the gospel. And so he describes them as the called, he describes them as beloved, and also kept. And what a great thought this is when you start thinking about our relationship or the fellowship um, that we have with Christ. It means to guard from loss or injury properly or keeping an eye. And this word is referenced numerous times in this short letter. If you mark in your Bible, uh, I would suggest putting a line from verse 1 and and mark verse number 21. Uh, In verse number 21, this last section, he's going to talk a little bit more about application. And so he reminds them that they are kept uh, by God. But then he reminds them in verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So there's a good balance here when it comes to our salvation in Jesus Christ. He says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. So as Christians, we should have great confidence 
in our salvation in Jesus Christ. Because he says you're called, you're beloved, and you are kept. Yet at the same time, there's something that we need to do. We need to keep ourselves in the love of God. And I like what one person said, we're safe in the hands of Jesus, but we must remain in his hands. And so again, there's this idea of confidence in our salvation as long as we remain with Jesus Christ. Now there are some that he's going to talk about who no longer remain with Jesus Christ. And there's others that he's going to say, hey, you need to snatch some of these brethren from the fire so that they're not lost. And so as you think about Jude and what he's going to do here, again, Jude is emphasizing uh, this confidence that we should have in Christ, um, the confidence in our salvation, and yet at the same time, making sure that we remain with Christ. Um, We get to decide if we're going to remain in his hands or not, right? Uh, Remember in John chapter 10, turn over there real quickly. In John chapter 10, when Jesus was speaking about himself being the good shepherd, in John chapter 10 and verse 27 through 29, uh, Jesus reminds us about those who are his sheep and how his sheep will respond or hear his voice. John chapter 10, verse number 27 and 28. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And so as his sheep, we have to hear his voice, and as his sheep, we have to follow him. And as we do that, we too can have great confidence in our salvation found in Jesus Christ. Well, what's interesting here. If you look at verse number six, as he talks about angels, and he's going to mention angels as an example of those who have, um, who have rebelled and who are condemned, some of these angels, it says in verse six, and angels who do not keep their own domain, but abandon their proper abode, he has kept, I believe it's the same word there, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so that word can be used in a positive sense. It also can be used in a negative sense. You see another word similar to that in verse 13, where he says, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. And so this idea of kept and keep is something that is emphasized in this short letter. And it's also a reminder for those who are uh, rebellious against God. Uh, what, is, what they have to look forward to, and that certainly is eternal separation and punishment from God. So I think it's an interesting study just looking at this word here and this idea uh, and the confidence certainly that we have in our salvation in Christ as long as we keep ourselves in the love of God. Now, let me ask you this question, and we'll jump around with some of the questions since this is our last class. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Uh, And I'll give you a hint. Uh, He gives us some examples throughout the letter. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? How how are we going to be able to do that? Uh, How do we remain faithful with God? What does Jude say in the letter to these Christians that you can do right now? And if you're not doing that, we all need to really think about when it comes to our faith. Let me get some feedback and hear from you guys. Any thoughts? What's he showing in the letter? Go ahead, brother. So number one, yeah, number one, we have to contend for the faith, which means we've got to know some things about the faith. Uh, if we're going to contend for something, and this is our faith in Christ, then we have to know some things about the faith. Yeah, what else? Verse 8, it talks about some behaviors that kind of d- d- describe uh, how they've gone astray. Think of listening to their own reasoning, you know, their own dreams, yes. defiling the faith rejecting authority, all things that they, he then goes and uses these Old Testament examples to show how, how did it help them. Well, they wound up uh, either saw more uh, <laughs> or, uh, you know, being swallowed up to all these numerous examples of how they <coughs> departed from uh, the correct path. Yeah, absolutely. So if we're going to keep ourselves in the love of Christ, we can't reject his authority. Um, and think about Diotrephes in Third John. That's exactly what Diotrephes was doing because he was rejecting the authority of the Apostle John. And so, yeah, to keep ourselves in the love of God, um, number one, we've got to know the faith, be willing to contend for it, uh, be willing to submit to God and what he has given to us uh, through his apostles. What else do you see in the letter, contextually, Richard? Uh, 
20 through 23 lends to that. Uh, verse 21 says, Await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way you will keep yourself safe in God's love. So he, he talks about uh, building each other up in faith. Uh, pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering and rescue others. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Yeah, going back to verse 20, um, there's this building up of ourselves in, in the most holy faith. So as Christians, we continue to grow. That's 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praying in the Spirit, uh, my understanding, that's according to His will. That's 1 John chapter 5. We talked about that, about how we pray according to the Spirit or according to His will. Think about this as well, the, the assistance from one another. One of the ways that we can keep ourselves in the love of Christ and remain with Him, we're going to need one another, aren't we? So much so that sometimes one of us may have to snatch or help the other person or other brother or sister in Christ um, to, uh, to make sure that they're staying on the right path. Verse 21, I think you mentioned that too, Richard. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So our minds also have to be on the return of Christ. The return of Christ... Uh, Going back to Acts chapter 1, that's one of the themes early on in Christianity. Remember the angels told the, uh, the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verses 9, 10, 11, they saw Jesus ascending into heaven, and he said in the same way that he's ascended, he will come again. Uh, remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, turn over there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, please, and verses 9 and 10, this was a young congregation. Um, and yet they are remaining faithful to God. Uh, they are kept, beloved, and called, and they are keeping themselves in the love of God as well. In verse number 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, good definition of repentance, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. That was one of the verses that I uh, used in my sermon this past Sunday. This idea of waiting, and not just waiting, but he says waiting anxiously in verse 21 uh, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Uh, maybe some of us, hopefully all of us, are looking forward to the new year, uh, new opportunities, new vacations, new job opportunities, new sports, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, kids have this with Christmas. Maybe adults still have this too, right? Where you, you're ready to open up those gifts. It's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Some of you are looking at me like, no. But maybe the kids had that, all right? Um, well, there, there, there's, there's this uh, great anticipation. And sometimes we can lose that in our, in our walk with Christ, right? This world is not our home. We're only passing through. And we're all, unless he comes back first, going to pass through death. We're all going to die. We're all going to take that last breath. And so we have hope, and we don't have to view life in the way that the rest of the world does without hope. And so think about how this can keep you and me and the love of God remembering that Judgment Day is real, that he is coming back one day, and that day may be today. Troy, did you have your hand up too, brother? Yeah. I think some of our Jewish and Muslim friends kind of beat us on having a good prayer life because it does talk about praying there too and not just praying at you know, meal but other times during the day <coughs> situations we get an email from the elders or from one of the members or from God saying hey this situation is happening right now can you stop and pray about it or you know, this person lost their loved one whatever it happens to be just having an active uh, prayer life and, and taking those things to God not you know, God is uh, the magic genie where we rub the lamp and say, here's what I want, but laying our cares and our our, uh, our desires, especially for others, those who are preaching in difficult places, people who are going through tough times, but having, having that act of prayer. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm thankful for, uh, for brethren who, you know, who are uh, praying fervently. There, who is a brother in uh, Colossians chapter 4? Um, uh, his, my mind is, uh, I don't remember his name, over in Colossians chapter 4. 
uh, Epaphras. Uh, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse number, uh, verse number 12, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you and his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. So I love that language that he is laboring earnestly or intensely for the brethren in prayer. Think about what we may need to pray for for one another. What a great example here that we can stand, uh, that we can be steadfast, um, that we can do the will of God. So, you know, certainly there are uh, many brethren who are praying and um, praying fervently, and I'm thankful for that as well. But yeah, certainly there's, there's always this more, more room to grow. Uh, there's a lot of things to pray for. And Jude is also helping us to see what's really at stake here. Uh, eternity is at stake. And there are souls that are on the line here to the point that we have to save others, in verse 23, to the best of our ability, helping our brethren and snatching them out of the fire, uh, yet while hating um, the kind of uh, life or, or conduct that they may have, but loving them enough to be able to talk to them uh, and to uh, be able to assist them. Any other thoughts with that? We're kind of jumping around a little bit. Uh, all right, so let's continue on here then. Um, looking at some of the questions, we, we've touched on some of these here. Uh, with the introduction here, uh, certainly with our relationship, uh, Troy talked about here this theme about continuing for the faith. Uh, let's read in verse 4 because that's the continuation of his thought here in verse number 3. He says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Is there another New Testament letter uh, that sounds very similar to the letter of Jude? Anyone have any thoughts? Uh, there's another new, there is another New Testament letter that's very similar to this letter here. Anyone know or any, any uh, other letters come to mind? Second, yeah, Second Peter. Uh, what did you say, brother? Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 3, and I would even say 2 Peter chapter 2, um, where in, in those chapters here, um, in 2 Peter chapter 2, turn over to verse number 1. There's some question about, um, you know, was Peter forecasting now what Jude is talking about? They're very similar in nature, and there's some question about the dates. Uh, but nonetheless, there are warnings, and you have warnings here from an apostle with Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, uh, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality. Well, that's what Jude is warning them about in verse number 4 and really throughout the letter. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So very similar language. And what we find here, going back to Jude, is just, again, another reminder, a serious reminder, um, looking at Gnosticism. And certainly there can be others that could fall into this category as well. Um, but where is the danger coming from with respect to these uh, disciples? From within. What did Paul warn the elders in Acts 20 and verse 28 and 29? Within yourselves, right? And so there are attacks from without, but there's also attacks from within. And we see that in the book of Acts, don't we? Uh, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, it's from without. Then problems arise in Acts chapter 6. Uh, and so you have this back and forth. And so we know that um, Jude, again, um, with respect to the Gnosticism, uh, other false teaching that is denying Jesus uh, as their master, abusing his grace, um, these are all warnings for them. Uh, and so something very important for us to keep in mind. And what Jude is going to do, he's really going to lay out what these false teachers and what these attacks are going to look like. Uh, these are just some additional verses here I put up um, talking about the faith. If you go back to Acts 6, we'll just pause here real quickly. 
Uh, there were many priests who were uh, obedient to the faith. Uh, and the faith is something that is distinct and identifiable. It can be preached. It can be defended. Uh, it can be obeyed as well. And so going back to Jude here, certain persons had crept in unaware who had abused the grace of the Lord and denied our master, their master, Jesus Christ. And so in verse 5, he says, Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all. That's the second time that language is used, once for all. So these Christians were wise, knowledgeable, aware, and yet he's got to remind them. And that's what Peter did in Second Peter chapter 1, uh, 12 and 13, I believe. Uh, I know you already know these things to be true, but I have to remind you. So what three examples is he going to use to really drive home the point of, you know, what's going to happen to these false teachers, um, what their destruction is going to be? What three examples does he use uh, to drive home that point in Jude? What do you see there in verses 6, 7, and 8? Or really starting in uh, verse 5. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, he, he mentions the Israelites in verse 5. And one of the things too, that I was thinking about in this verse here, the Lord can save and the Lord can destroy. Uh, he saved, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. They were kept, but they did not keep themselves with God. They did not remain faithful. And so he uses this example of um, destruction or punishment that, that came upon those in the Old Testament who had been disobedient and rebelled. In verse 6, he says, Angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So we learn a couple of things here about angels, and sometimes this is where um, some questions are are asked with respect to angels. If you go back to Second Peter chapter two and verse number four, um, Peter is going to say something very similar uh, about angels as well. He says, "For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, so angels have choice. Uh, angels could rebel against God, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment." So there were some uh, angels, and I think we see that in the book of Revelation as well. Uh, who rebelled. And the result of that is eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And he says the same thing about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, going back to Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 19. He says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh... Some like to try to, you know, water this down or say, well, you know, the, the men in Sodom and Gomorrah were just, they were not hospitable men. Um, no, that, that wasn't the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he's using this language of this idea uh, of strange flesh um, and describing it as gross uh, immorality. It's different. It goes against what is natural. Uh, it was homosexual behavior, men uh, with men. And what he says here whether it's with the Israelites who did not believe, uh, the angels who did not keep their proper abode and rebelled against God, and even those in Sodom and Gomorrah who went against what is natural, uh, they too, and we know the story, they were destroyed uh, by God. And they are exhibited, he says in verse 7, as an example in undergoing pun the punishment of eternal fire. More and more people who profess to be Christians don't believe in the concept of hell. Don't believe that there's an eternal fire or eternal separation from God. And yet Jude is saying, well, no, there is such a thing. There is a judgment day. There is eternal fire. Uh, there will be this punishment. And so what he's doing, he's driving home and really d demonstrating who these individuals are who have crept in and who will be condemned just like these other examples because of their ungodly nature, and because of denying Jesus and who he is. In verse 8 he says, Yet in the same way, these men, and these men, my understanding is that he's talking about those who have crept in unaware. 
going back to verse 4. The Gnostic teachers, those who are denying Jesus. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses. Well, where is that in the Old Testament? Uh, Well, it's not recorded for us in the Old Testament. Uh, This is where I have to pull out Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. Now, Jude has given us some revelation that there was something that happened between Michael the archangel, who we read about, by the way, in um, uh, Old Testament books like Daniel, like Daniel chapter 9, and he is um, disputing with the devil uh, about the body of Moses. So why is he using this example? Well, he says, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things, they are destroyed." So he's using like an if-then statement. If Michael, who's an archangel, um, was careful with respect to uh, how he spoke against Satan, he wasn't necessarily giving him you know, respect or worshiping or, him, or anything like that. Um, but he did not pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord, put it in the Lord's hand, rebuke you. Then how much worse are these men who are speaking against the truth, rejecting the words of the apostles? So he's showing us all this to really demonstrate just how wicked these individuals were. Those who had crept in. Those who were seeking to deceive God's people. So much so that he says in verse, 10, or verse 11, Woe to them. Uh, when you see the woe, you're in trouble, all right? Woe to them. These men just re- utterly reject authority of God. They reject the authority of the apostles. It didn't matter what they were saying or doing in the flesh. You do whatever you want. They're abusing God's grace to dive and to enjoy uh, the sensuality in the flesh and then saying it really has no impact upon your spirit or your salvation. So he says, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. What was the way of Cain in Genesis chapter 4? What's the way of Cain? What was it? What way did Cain go? So you got murder, you got anger, you got pride. So they've gone the way of Cain. And for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. You guys remember the story of Balaam uh, with the donkey? Uh, And there's a spiritual attack against God's people. uh, Where Who was it? I think it was Balak, if I remember correctly, in Numbers chapter 22, uh, who wanted Balaam to pronounce a curse uh, and he just keeps talking to him, and eventually Balaam tells him how they, he can destroy the Israelites. And so he went after pay. Well, that's what these false teachers are doing. Uh, they're flattering the brethren, flattering people to get them to follow them. And not for their benefit, but for their own personal gain. Um, out of pride and pay and greed and perished, he says in verse 11, in the rebellion of Korah. Uh, this is the path. This is the ultimate uh, destruction or destination of those individuals, going back to verse 4, who have crept in. Uh, What happened with Korah and the rebellion? How did he rebel? Who remembers that story? Yeah. He was a Levite, part of the Levites, but they weren't satisfied with just being what what God had apportioned to that. They wanted the priesthood as well, so they were uh, uh, grumbling against Moses and Aaron. So that was the great story where Moses said, hey, put your censors out in front of your tent and we'll see who God supports. Yeah. Numbers chapter 16, and it wasn't just Korah, it was his, his family, right? There were three, other, or three men and, and their families. So you have these three examples of those where judgment is coming upon them. Uh, judgment because of their wicked behavior, of their rejection of God, uh, their abuse of the, of the grace of God, denying Jesus as the Master uh, and as the Christ as well. And so in verses 13, or 12 and 13, uh, what Jude does here, he, he really describes them, which is uh, uh, uses nature to describe them. 
Uh, these are men who are hidden reefs in your love feast. Uh, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. So you can't paint much more of a bad picture than that, can you? Of what is to come for those uh, who are teaching um, things that are false, seeking to deceive the brethren. Notice again in verse 13, he says, black darkness, which has been reserved forever. Uh, He talks about eternal bonds under darkness in verse 6. Jude has no problem talking about hell. Uh, Hell is a place where individuals will go. Um, And it's a choice that people have to make on their own if they so refuse Jesus uh, and and the salvation that he provides. And so what Jude is doing here again, uh, he is uh, warning. He said back in verse 3, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing. He's urging them to contend earnestly for the faith. This is what is at stake. Do not allow these teachers... And there are many um, evil spirits or uh, spirits or teachings of men today that can lead and deceive God's people. And so we have to be willing to contend for the faith that's been delivered once for all. What we have in Jesus Christ is sufficient. And so what Jude is going to do, look at verse 14. He says, it was also about these men that Enoch and the seventh generation from Adam. So we know that Jude believed in the book of Genesis, don't we? You got Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, You got Enoch in Genesis chapter 5. You got the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. It always says, and he died, right? And you got Enoch here. And the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice how he uses that word ungodly. And the contrast that you see with holy. Holy faith, right? Called. These are individuals who are ungodly. Sometimes people want to know, uh, are we missing something in the Bible, right? With what Enoch said. Um, No, we're not missing anything from the Bible, all right? Uh, Jude is inspired by God. Uh, Maybe this was a part of oral tradition, uh, but Jude has given us these words uh, that Enoch had prophesied. And that's what I think is going back to verse 4. That this condemnation had been foretold uh, for those who would uh, go down this path and act in this behavior. And so this had been spoken of uh, in times past uh, about these false teachers and what they would seek to do. And again, in verse 16, he says, these are grumblers finding fault, excuse me, following after their own lust. That goes back to verses 11, 12, and 13. He's just describing who they are, very much like Cain, who was selfish, and Balaam, and Korah. They're grumblers finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. You know, there are people today who seek to do that. There are people who seek to flatter people to gain an advantage um, with words and with teaching. And it's not for the purpose of giving a person freedom, but it's rather for the purpose of uh, keeping someone shackled in sin. And Peter would actually say that in Second Peter, uh, how these false teachers offer freedom. Uh, but really they have nothing to offer. So look at verse 17 as we wrap up here. Notice the contrast. He says, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers, that's Second Peter 3, following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, who are worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. They don't have fellowship with God. They don't have fellowship with the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, 
waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So what Jude does, he warns and he encourages. And I think that's a great reminder for us as we end 2023. Uh, There are things for us to be aware of, uh, teachings that we need to know. And in order for us to ultimately protect ourselves from false teaching, we must know what the truth actually is. We have to be able to understand the truth and define the truth and be able to share the truth so much so that when we hear something, we say, no, that, that doesn't line up with the faith. Uh, let me go back and double check, but that's not lining up with what has been delivered once for all. So Jude covers a lot of territory. I know this is only one class. Um, any final thoughts uh, with this short letter uh, of Jude? Please, Tim. Yes. Yes. Yeah, let's read that. Verse 24. Uh, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. That's what we have in Christ. We have great joy. And Jesus can give us the strength to endure to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. That's where our focus needs to be. That is our God. That is our Savior. And that is why we need to wait anxiously uh, for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. If you have questions, please let me know, uh, and we'll stop here.